and it is my pleasure uh, to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Victor McCrary. Good morning. Uh, I met him uh, two, three years ago, and I'm happy to say I participate and work closely with uh, the University of the District of Columbia. So I discovered Dr. McCreary as I discovered the University of the District of Columbia, which is really uh, a gem of a place in the middle of the District of Columbia. And of course, Dr. Victor McCreary is a native of uh, the district, which is a, a rare commodity these days, but in any event. Uh, so the University of the District of Columbia uh, is the only public university in the District of Columbia in the nation's capital. This is generally not known. And I discovered a uh, first-class facility in a great location uh, on Connecticut Avenue uh, and an impressive group of people working hard at innovation, not only in ped pedagogical uh, fields, but also in science and engineering and business. So it's a pleasure really to introduce him. He's a man who wears several hats. He's a scientist, a hard scientist, a real scientist, a chemist with uh, professional achievements that uh, uh, really deserves further uh, underlining, but they are all in the bio sketch that's contained in our booklet. He is currently the Vice President for Research and Graduate Programs at the University of the District of Columbia, UDC, and he leads a team uh, quite involved in growth, development, direction, and oversight of the university's research enterprise. He held similar positions at Johns Hopkins in the Applied Physics Lab at Morgan State University at the University of Tennessee, so he knows the South as well. He's a change agent, a serial innovator, but he is also a man who has taken a distance from the process of change and reflected on it. And uh, he had the opportunity to do so uh, when President Obama appointed him uh, to, the, uh, uh, to, to the NAB, uh, which is uh, to the NSB, which is part of the, uh, the National Science Foundation. So he was appointed to serve on the National Science Board in 2016 and then in 2020 became its vice chair. And that has been a very active board that has guided the nations in uh, new directions in science and technology. So it's really a delight, a pleasure and a treat to have him today to talk about uh, a Vision 2030 which, to get interesting answers to some of our questions from you. Thank you so much again for being here today. Thank you, Professor McIntyre. I wanna thank you for this invitation as well as your team. I wanna thank Adni Agrahultry and James Hobley who are part of your team uh, for uh, having me here today and all of the people to be at this 27th annual Georgia Tech Global Business Forum. I also wanna give a special shout out to my former uh, board colleague there, Bud Peterson, who, uh, as you know, is, has, has done well at Georgia Tech. And so, and has been very influential in, in what we're gonna talk about today. You know, listening to your previous conversation about manufacturing and what are we doing in the United States and where we are, all comes together here in this Vision 2030. And, what I'm gonna talk about for a few minutes today is where does the National Science Board see the country in terms of its science and engineering enterprise over the next decade? If we come back 10 years from now, how have things changed? And I'll show you kind of where we are and where we think we need to go and what is extremely important. So first of all, let me talk about what the National Science Board is all about. Um, Many government agencies have advisory boards uh, that help them, whether it's in the Department of Defense, Department of Commerce, certain agencies like NIST or uh, NIH. But we are the only board that has a governing role. We're not an advisory board. So we actually review the budgets of the National Science Foundation. We also look at their strategy and help establish policies. So that's one thing that's extremely important about the National Science Board, which was founded in 1950 by an act of uh, President Truman. We also advise the president and Congress. And so we work with the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, I wanna give a shout out to its leader, Eric Lander, who's extremely supportive in his team. And we put out um, communications in terms of like the science and engineering indicators, which talks about the health of the US science and engineering enterprise, as well as global competition that comes out every two years. So the next edition will be out in 2022. And we also issue policy reports that talk everything from education, workforce, 
STEM as it relates to science and engineering. I'd like to give a shout out to Ellen Ochoa, who is the chair of the National Science Board for the past two years, who has really helped in, in crafting this vision, as well as all my colleagues on the National Science Board. So next slide, please. So in 2005, the Science Board then put a vision out called 2020 um, of where they saw the science and engineering enterprise. Um, and so around 20, uh, 2019, 2018, we said, wait a minute, that vision is coming to an end and a lot of things have radically changed since 2005. Um, some of those things you talked about in the previous um, talks here in terms of manufacturing, the US manufacturing base, its competition with the global manufacturing base. A lot of things have changed in terms of the demography of the United States. Uh, a lot of things have changed in terms of the industries of tomorrow that we're looking at and where we compete at. And those are, for example, artificial intelligence, quantum information systems, 5G, uh, biotechnology, as well as advanced manufacturing. And obviously over the past year or two with the pandemic, it has also raised our issues in terms of how do we do science? How do we do science remotely? And where do we go to get the solutions that we need? So when we started this uh, effort of saying, okay, we need to now put a vision for, for the country, okay, for the next 10 years, where do we need to go? And so we did a number of listening sessions over about two years before this report was issued in 2020. So we first, we went out to example to our minority serving institutions. Uh, if you look at our population right now, these institutions, according to the National Academies at the undergraduate level, put out more STEM engineers than majority in, uh, institutions. We went to, for example, other uh, universities. We went to listen to uh, advisors on the NSS. We listened to the, listen the assistant director of division and program managers. And then we went out to the technical organizations, things like the American Chemical Society, American Institute of Physics. And then we said to ourselves, if we have this vision, and in 10 years from now, I would go down and see my good friend John down at Georgia Tech, and we would sit back and go, last last we speak. Where would we be 10 years from now? Okay. And so, and so this is somewhat of an eye chart, and I'll just read off, off some of the things they think that we could be. We could say, I think John and I would say, you know what, we've made the investments in the U.S. that have fueled a real innovation economy. Okay. okay. Uh, that the U.S. will remain in that magnet town. Okay. okay. That we are practicing the academic and scientific values that go throughout our world. You know, you know, you know that, that we are coordinating our efforts. I mean, a lot, a lot of times, times over the past, past we've done, done a lot of well with other, other agencies, agencies industry, industry, CEO, CEO academic leader. leader. But, but after, after those other well ups, we want to say we want more and more. We want one real partnership we have developed to create a relationship. That we can reach the STEM world workforce, okay? And it's creating opportunities for everybody. It's not that the innovation just happens from Austin to Austin, but happens everywhere, okay? That that U.S. STEM world workforce that we're doing reflects the monarchy of the United States. And that NSF is continuing to see some leader innovation and talent development. Uh, if you think, think, and again, a shout out to the Red Rider, Seth Zerama, I'm not trying to think. He says, you know, we are the United States talent and wealth development. And I support him in that state in terms of what we're fighting for the Red Rider Fellowship and other Red Rider research. Next slide, please. So, a couple of questions in all of the groups that we have met at different stakeholders. And that, as you can see, if you think about the science and engineering system for a country, it's got to involve all the government. It's got to involve the private sector. And it's got to involve academia. And what's new to your area is that involves community, ecology, and trade training. Because it's still built for workforce. People who have STEM skills do not possess the action degree. Absolutely, we support our economy. So we've got to have that dialogue, including them. And then something very recently that the board work is going to take on, and that our next public board meeting in December, we're going to talk about the issue of KK 12. 
because quite frankly, it's too late to ask a young woman or a young man at 18 years old when they want to sit down and be a job job recorder. So the question is, can we keep up our RBD fundamental research or not? I'm sure it's some data about that. Can it be made with those discoveries that now in power in our business is not an entrepreneur? Uh, we've seen a lot, a lot of legislation that's coming down, down about, about, about the direct record of the National Science Foundation is called Translation Between Partnerships. That's, that's all about, about technological translation and a large part of technology commercialization. And then the question is how do we increase the STEM and skills and opportunities for all? Because I can say this if we have all the laboratories and fine laboratories in the world, we can have all the fine schools in the world, we can put all the money we want. But if, but if you don't have to have talent, talent, it is all for So the next, next slide, slide, please. please. So, so if you read the vision, vision, and I, and I really, really encourage you to go to the NSC website, website, you can download uh, this document, document uh, as, as well as the John slides are available for distribution. We came up with four pillars that are extremely important for roadmap that we have if the U.S. has going to retain its competitive stature in terms of science and engineering. And that is the cost of the global science and engineering community that is working internationally, expanding the amount of innovation that kind of sets that that forward, that, that everything is not done in Silicon Valley, everything is not done in 128, everything is not done in research right now. But there's a vast scope of innovation in the middle of our country and all over our country. Um, um, I, I used to work around and tell you, but I, I used to be a scientist at Bell Laboratories. Murray Hill, at that, that, that time, was one, one of the premier of Bell Laboratories. Lab laboratories. If you think about, about innovations that came from, the, the, from that lab in the 30s, 40s, 40s, 40s 50s, 50s, the men and, and women who, who were there at Bell Lab Laboratories, a lot of these people came from farmers, came from the middle part of the country, and made these innovations. So I have a belief that the talent is there. We've got to also deliver the benefits of research. That's why I, one reason why we have tip the record because, uh, again, again, to what the record of Nathanson would say uh, in the vernacular is from the bed and the bench benefits. benefits. Okay, okay. How we make the differences in people's lives. All right. All right. And then, then finally, the other person named Talent for America. How do we get the high pipeline talent that is extremely important for what we need to do? So, so going to the next slide. The first thing I want to talk about is about the band band yaga. So let's go to the next slide, please. Um, one of the areas that we would like to do is, and, I, and I, I, I've said this uh, just earlier, is how do we tap that relationship with our country? You all have probably heard of the Apple or Orange Act, which is all about the Apple Act. It's 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 about the Apple Act. In terms of the Apple Act. It's about the Apple Act. This program has been around uh, well over three decades. Okay, and what it is is to try to stimulate our R&D in states that have a low threshold of uh, receiving funding. In this case, our NSS has less than 0.75 cents. And so these states here that I highlighted are at four states. As you can see, the program has been successful because some of those states, some of those states have graduated in low level of prep sports things like Iowa, Iowa Tennessee, Utah, Utah, and then they were all in Missouri or New Mexico. But you still see the other states in the southeast and states up in the Midwest, West, where, um, up in particularly up in the mountain areas, where we can still tap into the innovation. So if we go to the next slide, please. One of the discussions. Right, right now, now the National Science, Science Board, Board is having is, 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 you know, is how do we use the F score to reach out to not only the major schools, but particularly all of the schools, particularly the tribal colleges, the Hispanic service institutions, and the historical black, black colleges, colleges and universities to tap out the innovation. Because, because, let's say, face it, if you need the talent, is a distributed and innovation is to be legally, but access is probably not. not. We need to have to have those places in order to get those innovations. This is just a sample of the types of centers, again, that NSF has funded uh, under the policies of the EPSCO program. 
one of the things that we're looking at right now is a model of the Indian University of Swabog Research Center. These are sets of what we bring in industry, small businesses, large businesses, technical uh, schools, community colleges, in the uh, university folks, and in the public school system involved in, in how do we bring this So I'll give you an example of one uh, model of that. As we were looking around and trying to develop this issue about the skills of the workforce, which I talked about previously. Uh, in South Carolina, they're, they're trying, trying to build, build a center, center for aerospace based here. Bones located, located, located in Charleston. You have Clemson there, there, which is an R1 university. Okay, okay. You, you have, have South, South Carolina, Carolina State, State and Clapham, which are HBCUs. You have Warren Starling College, College, which does a lot of advanced and added main main back action. So we went down and, and they are working on a program called ATE, Advanced Technological Education Program, where actually this is unfunded. By by Clemson. So think of the Clemson is looking at, at the cutting edge aerospace based materials. Okay, okay. Particularly materials that have low observables. But before those materials become fully qualified, someone's got to figure out how you manufacture. Okay, okay, okay. Because eventually you want to be able to sell that this own. And so they're working as the partners with the community college there. And, and those sorts of folks in the community college, college are also providing knowledge and information back to Clemson in terms of, okay, with these big materials, you can't use conventional manufacturing techniques. You may have to add in using labels, okay? And, and as you know, added manufacturing not only has had foundation, but it's also kind of an art. Okay, and, and how, how do we also create these next generation of machines who are going to work work? Uh, as equal uh, part part with our science, science to break these materials. So, so this is where you, you see a, a, a IUCRC, and where we're, we're trying, trying to look at and reimagine uh, uh, EPSCOR. And those conversations, conversations are going on right, right now, now with the National Science Board and the National Science Foundation. We're working with the Ted Next slide, please. So, the next one is this developed stem down environment. And like I said today, I'll harp on it again. again. You can have all the best libraries in the world. You can print all the money you want. Okay. okay. Uh, you can have all the universities where people can learn things, but you need to have talent. That, that, that is, is automatic. So, if we go to the next slide. slide. Um, this, this is from, from our, our national. national uh, Center of Science and Engineering and Artistics, which is how I was in the National Science Foundation under the SSE right right group. And if you look at this, over the past two decades, our share of global R&D has increased. And most of it has has gone over to China, okay, and the Far East. The question is, is this a continuing trend? It is. Okay. And in some cases, the big concern is, well, what are we going to get a town and what are we going to get a competitive? So if we go to the next slide. The most big thing that they're doing right now, this is called the action. How do we attract our team in and other representatives? So that they have groups or teams in leadership roles in the SSD ecosystem. So I'm not just talking to students and people working in the advantage. But who are the future professors going to be working in physics, chemistry, biotechnology, engineering, and other parts? Who are the folks who are going to be senior managers in companies like Lockheed Martin, like Boeing, like Merrimark? Okay. Who are the folks in government who are going to be program directors and direct residents, places like Harvard, National Science Foundation, Office of the Navy Sisters, NASA. The place is where we need to find so that this next generation is coming through and sees a path how going to fall forward. Next slide, please. So we have really taken the cause of business needs. Okay. And if you look at this, again, this is from our National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics as well as the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, over the past decade, they got to get better than that. And by the way, I part of the, I have, have updated slide that also shows the photos of the tribal nations. But if you look at tribal nations, uh, black, African, American, Latinos, and women, we're not out of population generality. 
four of the last nine teams, teams and we have four of those six 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 uh, again, again, we've got to have to double those numbers. numbers. You know, uh, uh, I like to tell people, people quite, quite frankly, frankly, this reminds me of 1947. And, and the United, United States is a couple of dollars, and we're, and we're up against, against the, the New York Yankees. Yankees. Okay, okay. And we want to need the Jack and, and the Jack and Rob Robbins to come to all of the help us. Next slide, please. And this is not only in the uh, the real world, but if we look at, at where we see the SS brings in the award or over the these past, past two decades, decades, you can see the computer sciences that are going on very, very, very fast. fast. Uh, the same thing you can go for math and statistics, or now we want to call it data science. science. So it's extremely so important, important that we have have follow The next slide, slide please. And so, so this is where we're going to talk about skill and technical work. work. This is a report that came out in 2019 by the National Science Board that, that talks about a number of work in this area. area. Uh, uh, particularly, we found on the very illuminating for us on, on the National, National Science Board, board and we uh, talked about this is because uh, we didn't realize the magnitude of the work and the importance of how it touches a lot of the assets that NSS has. So we look at the next slide. This was our, our an old model of how we looked at the science and engineering world workforce. And then we did it to folks, folks looking at folks, folks back at the degree and above. So this is an old model up here where we're looking at the skill set of the workforce. But if we go next slide, so the Mass Center of Science and Engineering, science engineering Statistics now has a more real business view of what the STEM workforce is. So let me just give you a bottom line. line. You can read this if you can. But right, right now, now, there's 125 million people, people who are in the total of the U.S. workforce. Of that, about, about 30, 30 million of them are what we call the STEM them workers. So, so those are everybody from high, high school, school all the way up to PhD. About 18, 19 million, or well over 50 percent, are what we call the skilled and tech workforce. And those are people who are post high school, all the way up, do not have a bachelor's degree. And we're talking about everything they own, all the electricians, well, Health IT workers, IT workers, um, um, HVAC workers. A lot of these people who are extremely important to our economy. I will also say that these folks are not traditionally what you may think of when um, you think about electricians or automotive mechanics. For example, today's electrician is not your daddy's daddy mom's electrician. Today's electrician, for example, has no Fourier analysis. They have to do code. They, 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 they use thermal sensing equipment to look it out that damn panel. A lot, a lot of sand in the wall. Okay. okay. And, and by, by the way, they can make a good look of um, um, One thing they focused on the skill, skill technical workforce was there was a big thing applied by this and that, that. The only way to take the class is the college degree. Well, if you look at your own labor, labor statistics and you look at salary, that's not true. And right now, now is a short order. And we can see that there are multiple. Pathways and on and off ramps for students to, to go into the skill set of the workforce or the living living. and maybe and also follow another pathway path for a college college degree. But I'll leave that down for a question. Next slide, next slide please. Also, the business team, just like the skill set of the workforce, was tends to hire a large number of minorities. We also we have to look at the upper upper. Up. So, so, this is a study that was funded by the National Science Foundation for over 10 years. Looking at it, represented people of color. color. Okay, okay. At, at the top 50 U.S. schools in their chemistry department. So this was just published last fall uh, by, by CNBC. It was a publication of the American Chemical Society. American Chemical Society is part of the project. It's called the Oxide Project. Okay, and, and what it looked at was what was the sentence in the faculty ranks? ranks. Okay, that's really important, important because if, if I, I am an undergraduate, undergraduate or graduate student, student, I want to see people who look like me and who are hurt for me to go into these fields. Bottom line, line is, is, over the past, past 10 years, years, the numbers, numbers have gone down 4.66%, That's that's that that. And so, so we as a board are, are looking, looking at this and saying, saying okay, okay, how can we assess the lives? Uh, uh, faculty uh, in these top schools. schools. And this, this is just a chemistry department. Doing the very hard to get more of the representatives and people who are faculty members. 
Next slide. The other the thing that we want to do is be able to work with our fire engineers and CCs. So, as uh, 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 Professor McIntyre uh, said, the Vice President for Research at the University of Georgia, Columbia. Columbia, we are the only public institution and land grant in the United States. The District of Columbia, Columbia the only public HBCU. The other one is the private one, my alma mater, Howard University. We are also the only urban land grant. Okay, okay. And, and here, here, what we are, are here, I've just this out with the other 11 of our RQs are named as HBCDs. And you can look at the research expenditures and also from NSS. Now, when I give this talk on NASA and AI, I also show another slide which shows the top 10 schools and research expenditures. And in most cases, they dwarf them by tours of magnitude. Which means one of the things we've got to make further their best is build the research capacity at our FACDs. Why? Next slide, please. This is the list of the 15 ABED accredited undergraduate engineering programs of 15 HCCs. And while they only compose 3% of the engineering schools in the United States, they put out 30% of the black engineers in the country. And so, so this is extremely important, as you can see, UDC is one of our schools. And so we have made sure we have made an investment because, again, yeah, I won't tell you about my age, but probably the John Dyer's or some other generation. You know, no, research used to be in the Herbert graduate as a master's education. But now, now these companies want undergraduates who have a couple of internships, whether they be internal at the university or external or for to come on the stage and get a degree to already have that experience, a couple of that knowledge so that they can hit the ground on your own. So, so next slide, please. So, so sometimes, sometimes some of the questions I'm sure some of you all will have had in your minds is, okay, okay uh, uh, Dr. McCrary. But we're the people. We can't, we can't, we can't you know, find them out. And, and I don't have, have to say, you know what, I, I don't, don't have to say anything. You know, we're here, we can't find them. And I'm going to tell you why. One, I, I have my product, product of military family. family. My mom and dad had both alarm army. They were both, they were both army, army officers. officers. Okay. okay. Uh, so, so, so I understand when my mom was a chairman of the Chiefs of Staff under President Obama. So, you know what? There's all these guys who look like, like me around, around senior ranks. ranks. We need to diversify us. And a lot of people say, say well, well, no, we don't know where you're going to find it. Well, well, like I said, I, said, I grew up in a military family on Saturday night. night. My mother said, shine your shoes. You go to church on Sunday. Sunday. You shine your shoes. It's, it's pretty, a pretty much a command and control structure. You don't take excuses. And I have to be able to have my mother a lot of credit. But he said, no, no, I don't believe that. You pay out there to go to find and so, and so the first time we raised a number of the officers that they brought out and said, hey, let's see these folks who can eventually be senior generals and captains. And one of the people in that controversy was an officer who was an officer. Well, you may know right now, he is now the Secretary of Defense. And so it is extremely important to start generating a new cadre of domestic diverse and talent. And that's, that's what, what NSD, NSD needs to do. We need your help. Okay. All, okay. Of, All of your folks, folks at the Global Business Forum to help us make this vision a reality. Next, Next slide, slide, please. please. Uh, and this is why it's very important because right, right where we're, we're at, at there are a lot of number of HBCUs, Clark Atlanta, Morehouse, Spell, uh, Morehouse School, and that is the because, because it's also such a national security. security. Because there was a large uh, HBCU student population that have a large percentage of their students who are born as citizens. citizens. It's extremely it's important, important, particularly down in Atlanta, but also in the United States, States as a large, large number of our manufacturers and, and government folks who support our defense and industry, industry, as well as what I talked about the American Chemical Society, as well as Chemical Facility Safety Act, they can hire our U.S. citizens. If these students can keep their nose clean, they can get the issues, they can get clear, and they can get uh, formed and get right into the economy. So, so next, next slide. slide. So, this, so this is a message to you all. This is something my, my 
my little brother Paul Paul say to me. And that is because I'm not a dictator on the right hand. And that means to have to get engaged. Um, you've got, got to, to give your input to the board. Uh, you've got 25 board members. board members. I ask you to get involved because it's extremely important. Because at this, at this point, point in time, time if you're not, you're not there, there, then what's going to happen is that your voice is not going to be heard. heard. And that, that that's what's important to set this vision. So, so, next slide, slide please. please. So, so, again, again with John, John and Anna and Jane and Dean and all of call, I hope we'll take this from now and during that time, we can sit back and say that we've accomplished all of these things and a lot more. But what I want to ask is, 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 is don't wait 10 years from now. Is give us your insights right now. Uh, let us come out out to your universities, your industries, government agencies, and talk to you about our budget. Talk to us about what the National Science Foundation. Some of the new programs they had in place. And how can we work together as our partners to achieve the vision of the future? And so, in conclusion, um, I have a video about NSB and NSF. And if you have that, would you please please make that video? America is innovation. And the National Science Foundation has helped our nation push the frontiers of science and engineering for more than 70 years. From silicon to photons, the cells that drive us and the impulses that move us. From the earth beneath to the stars above. Real, tangible progress stems from, well, STEM. If we want to ensure America continues to power that progress, we must ask ourselves, how can we keep our lead in fundamental research? How can we make sure American discoveries continue to empower economic growth and national security? And how can we increase STEM skills and opportunities for all Americans? In the face of increasing global competition, we must answer those questions by doing the following deliver benefits from research to help U.S. businesses and entrepreneurs succeed, develop STEM talent nationwide to build the workforce America needs to invent the future, expand the geography of innovation so everyone in the country can participate in and benefit from science and engineering research and development, and foster a global community that attracts international partnerships and talent. The road ahead may be filled with twists and turns, but we have a map. Our vision for 2030. Join us in charting this new territory. Together, we can build the future of our country through the power of science and engineering. I agree with you. The time is now, it's not yesterday. And if you're not uh, on the menu, you pro if you're not at the table, you're probably on the menu. Uh, Georgia Tech since the late 50s, and I've really tracked the history of Georgia Tech, has done a lot. Uh, in terms of minority, underrepresented minorities in the United States, we have uh, a string of uh, articulation agreements with all oh, 20 plus uh, HBCUs going back to the 70s. Uh, we have uh, really, we, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that we graduate the largest number of undergraduate engineers, minority engineers, Hispanic, uh, Black Americans, the whole range. Uh, so very in, in quick order, what can main university, mainline universities like a Georgia Tech or an Emory University, our next speaker uh, is a professor at Emory University, what can they do? And then obviously there is a relationship between the nation's performance and achievements and competitiveness. The second uh, seemingly unrelated question is in the uh, techno competition between uh, uh, the United States and the People's Republic of China, there are all sorts of areas in which China is reputed to be in the lead. Is there a chance to catch up as we mobilize all elements of American societies in the, uh, in the drive to excellence and achievements? So John, to, your, to answer your first question, I would say how majority universities, what they can do is first of all, to be intentional and deliberate. So I would say, for example, in your articulation agreements that you have, um, ask yourself what have been the outcomes that have happened over the past 10, 20 years? And make sure if you look at those outcomes, then say to yourself, does that reach your satisfaction? We're doing that at NSF and NSB right now. 
because and a lot of uh, other government agencies are doing the same thing. They're making this shift from inputs to outputs to outcomes. And so um, I would say NSF is leader uh, under Director Ponchanathan. He's saying, OK, look, you know, over the past 10 years, yes, we may have put in hundreds of millions of dollars, for example, for minority serving institutions. But that shouldn't be the metric of how much we spent. The question is, you've got to ask yourself when you get into these partnerships, what are the outputs? So what are the number of students who go on for jobs? Where are they five years from now? How does that stimulate real faculty partnerships that lead to, for example, research proposals? How does this help young faculty go along the promotion and tenure track? It's really about looking at those outcomes, okay, and, and being intentional. And sometimes that's going to take a little time. I, I, would, say, I would say, for example, we have put together an MOU with Penn State uh, Applied Research Laboratory. But it's not just going to be about internships, but it's going to be about an equal partnership. So also in those partnerships, you know, partnerships are relationships and you have to put time into them. You can't just have the general counsel draft a document, the president sign it, and hope it works. It put a lot of work into it, you know, and we have, we are doing that, making sure people monitoring those things, bring people also inclusive into events, whether they're like research fairs, uh, whether they are like internship fairs, whether they are part of your speaker series. It's about that whole inclusivity versus, okay, we just have, this is someone who's just a, a tangential partner. So that's one thing you do. And you've got to have people who know how to do it. This is a real people business, okay? Uh, it, it's something that can't be managed just behind a desk. The second thing you asked was about our lead. So there are people who are concerned that, for example, we may be falling behind to foreign competition in artificial intelligence and things like quantum information systems. You know, my take on it, it's a neck and neck race, okay? Uh, there are a lot of th things that the United States, I believe, uh, is doing. Uh, some of those things we're doing are probably being carried out by the Department of Defense, and we can't talk about those things here. But, and I do believe a lot of things are going on in private industry. However, I do believe this is a Sputnik II moment. This is not a time to be complacent. Uh, and I can say Sputnik II because I'm old enough that I remember when Sputnik I was launched and um, I was a student in the District of Columbia public school system and hundreds of millions of dollars flowed down from the National Defense Education Authorization Act for students to get into science, which is what got me into science. My father and I built a crystal radio when I was six years old. I mean, all of these things came down. I think now they are seeing the urgency because they are starting to see that in some of these areas, we are getting stiff, stiff competition. And so this is, and, and that, so this goes back to the diversity issue. And that's why I use the metaphor. It's 1947, we're the Brooklyn Dodgers. The Yankees are up, okay? How are we gonna beat them, okay? We have this talent right in our backyard. We have to go out, we've gotta to talk to these students. We've gotta make things also to attract them that is relevant. So I'll give you one example and then I'll take the next question. Um, there was a program that NASCAR was doing uh, because young men and, and also young women, they wanna diversify that uh, along gender and racial and ethnic lines are interested in cars. Uh, got these kids interested in cars at the high school level. And then by their interests underneath, let them understand the scientific principles of how do you make an engine and make a car go faster? Because if you think about bore and stroke in an engine, which is kind of the language you use. I remember when I was 16 year old and had my car and I had to tune it up. To make that faster, instead of doing trial and error, if you understand PV equals NRT, then you can understand the phenomenology of what makes an engine go faster. And now you get kids really excited to go into STEM because they see how it relates to them on an everyday level. It, uh, we, we didn't have questions and answers on the last session, so I'd like to just quick roll the two questions that we have into one because we're running up against time. Uh, so I'm going to combine them both. Um, the first question is uh, about the plan to create a 21st century workforce and digital vocational skills. Uh, the person from uh, the uh, Suresh Sharma points out that neither degree schools nor technicals have really good and affordable programs in that space. 
Uh, uh, so what can we do to do that? And the question, other question to roll into, which is sort of related, uh, does the NSF sponsor competition and awards in middle and high school to make people aware of its mission? And that would answer both of our questions. Thank All right. You. So one of the things is there is a program that most people don't know about that NSF has. It's called the Advanced Technological Educational Program. It's been around since 19, I want to say 1993, 1995 by an act of Congress specifically to fund technical and community colleges and to get and to fund new curriculums. Um, it works with industry and uh, industry doesn't receive any funding. All industry has to do is say, hey, look, well, when these students finish this course of study, at least you will interview for jobs. It doesn't have to promise them for jobs. Uh, the director there is uh, Dr. Celeste Carter. I will give her a shout out. She does a great job. And um, it's been funded at about 60 million for many years. Uh, the program I talked about in my talk about Florence Darlington and Clemson, that's an ATE program. Um, now that the Congress has seen this urgency in the workforce, they have doubled the fund on there. And I would say um, here at our, you know, UDC is unique. We have a workforce development program, community college, four-year, a better credit engineering, PhD programs in law school. We're the first school uh, in the nation in a community college to teach quantum information systems as part of curriculum. And so one of the things I could say you could do if at Georgia Tech is to look into uh, the NSF ATE program, work with one of your community colleges to say, hey, look, in our area, because I know, for example, Atlanta, one of the biggest things is healthcare IT, okay? Uh, and they're looking for people at a two-year level. UDC just won a $9 million award from the Department of Health and Human Services at a two-year level to create that next cadre of health IT workers. So you might look into that ATE program, find a suitable partner there, and put in a proposal. Very good suggestion. Uh, are there, uh, my colleague, Andy, do you have, do you have some questions? Uh, because you, you wear several hats and you are, you run a manufacturing operation and you're also a uh, uh, the, the chair of the UIBS and uh, uh, quite aware of uh, issues of workforce uh, skilling and upskilling. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as uh, Dr. McRae mentioned uh, towards the beginning of his comments, that uh, we are uh, late and uh, we cannot sleep anymore for the next 10 years, uh, especially from manufacturing side, I'm very concerned. It's not that, uh, you know, those kind of industries can be put together in two months, three months, six months. It takes uh, 10, 15, 20 years of planning. And before that, we need to have people, engineers and uh, designers, architects uh, for those kind of skills. And the competition is increasing uh, at an increasing pace. Uh, you know, we look at Southeast Asia, look at other countries. But I, I believe... Uh, you know, uh, you know, your comments, uh, Dr. McCready, on this uh, as the closing thoughts. My, my thoughts on this is, is that I think we have been here before, okay? We've seen this story. Um, I'm not quite that old, but, you know, right, or, right after uh, World War II, we had to bring in a lot of talent as well as we had to train a lot of talent here. So it's got to be a balance. You know, we've got to be able to be a magnet that we can tra attract both international talent. But we also got to make that investment our domestic talent. So we've done that before. We saw that early in the 60s with the space race. Okay. We trained a lot of scientists across the country. Um, and we reached out. That's why I talk about the expanded geography of innovation. We didn't just go to the Ivy League schools or the schools, you know, or, uh, on the West Coast. We went everywhere to get talent. We have to have this call to action again to do this, particularly in the manufacturing area. I mean, right now, manufacturing is, is less than 11% right now. But, for example, for some of those industries, if you think about the Norfolk Navy, uh, Naval Base, which is the largest Navy base in the world, and with the new Virginia-class submarines, you need electricians and welders. Those folks have to be U.S. citizens, and those are good paying jobs, okay? So not only is it an economic issue, it's a national security issue, but we have to also tell our students and young people coming through that there are jobs and opportunities in the middle class um, that you can tailor along. 
and, and here I'll give you a good example. We have an aviation maintenance program here at UDC. I can take a young woman or a young man who has no mechanical aptitude right out of high school. They can get a two year FAA certificate, not a degree, but a certificate. And it's right at National Airport. They could walk across the tarmac and go to Southwest and get a job that pays anywhere between 60 to $70,000 a year. Now, if you think about this pathway in maybe about five years, they say, look here, Ani, look here, James, I want you to get off the tarmac. Uh, you got a good work ethic. I like what you're doing. You got some good ideas. I'll send you to school, whether it's UDC or Howard or whatever, to go get your bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. So now you get the degree, but by the way, you're not paying for it because that's one of the things we're seeing right now. A lot of these students are saddled with debt. And then they say after a couple of years, hey, James, hey, Ani, um, you know what? I want you to go get some courses in project est estimation, program man management, okay, accounting, because I want you now to run the business, okay? Whether you need a degree or, or just a, a couple of extra courses. And by the way, they will pay for that. What we haven't done well here in America, at least in the past two decades, is talk to people, to our young folks about all the options. We've made the mistake to say that college is the only path to the middle class, when that's not necessarily true. When I was in high school, we had woodworking, we had um, electronics, okay? All that's been stripped out. So yes, we have kids who are very computer savvy, but for example, in our engineering schools right now, among many of the needs, they are working with the International um, uh, Union of uh, Brotherhood of Electrical Workers because a lot of these students who are probably much smarter than I am, but they don't know the difference between a Phillips screwdriver and a flathead screwdriver. And so they're trying to get, you have to couple that experience, okay, together. Um, and I so think if we can provide more of those experiences, because quite frankly, to, and I like what you've been saying about manufacturing. I think the decline, particularly of males, both um, we're seeing it in white males, black males, Latino males going into STEM is the encapsulation of the internal combustion engine, okay? <laughs> you don't have a chance to tinker when you're a kid, okay? And that's extremely important, particularly important because when we went to Detroit as a board about three years ago when we were doing this report, they're gonna wanna to have about a million workers to make autonomous vehicles. Okay, and EVs, but they don't need to have a bachelor's degree. But they're not the people who came to Henry Ford's plants in the 20s, which were unskilled labor. They have to know how to code. Cars are no longer mechanical systems, they're electromechanical systems. And so those are the type of people that you need. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Victor, for a, uh, an inspiring, stimulating, and challenging presentation. I look forward to visiting you at UDC soon, as soon as we resume traveling on a regular basis. And I hope you can come down to Georgia Tech and share your wisdom and your recommendations with us, recommendations for action. Thank you so much. A very grateful for your time and insights. Thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you and all your colleagues. Have a great day. Thank you, Dr. McCrary. Have a good afternoon, sir. Thank you. Uh,